Welcome everybody to the third Knot Theory lecture. In my last lecture, I talked about representing knots by diagrams. This is not the only way you can represent knots, uh, but it's a very efficient and useful way of doing it. And you can make um, knot tables like, uh, for instance, the following. So, there's a knot table up to seven crossings. And um, as the, the convention is that, that the con continuous pieces of arc like these are over the pieces of arcs which are broken up here. So, we go from the unknot to the trefoil to the figure eight knot, the sink foil, and so on and so forth. Um, and in principle, every knot will eventually come on this table, although um, the number of diagrams as you increase the number of crossings, uh, for instance, these are seven. These are the bottom row will have seven crossings. Um, just rises exponentially. Okay, so that's a knot table. And um, I often think of mathematics being a bit like mining. You, you dig away at some ground and... Uh, you don't find anything and then you you move away and or you try digging in a different direction and suddenly you come upon um, a chamber full of gold or something um, or perhaps not but with the case of not diagrams it's amazing how much information they contain if you look at them in the right way Now, you may recall that we took a diagram and converted it into a cipher graph in the following way. So let's have a look at this method. So we take, take, a, take a diagram and look at the crossings. <coughs> now the crossings are divided into two types. They're positive crossings. We're assuming that the knot diagram is oriented following the arrow. And this is a positive crossing because as, the, as you approach from underneath, the overcrossing gives you a right-handed screw as you go through. Okay, and so we replace that by two parallel lines and a red bridge joining the two parallel lines with a plus sign indicating that it's a positive crossing. And similarly for a negative crossing or left-hand crossing, sometimes called, you do the same thing, but you, the sign now is minus instead of plus. And you do that with all the crossings and then you've eliminated the crossings and you get what's called a cipher graph. So this is, uh, this consists of a number of circles called cipher circles. And some groups of these are nested. If they're nested, they're all oriented the same way either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And some of the circles are joined to other circles by these red bridges, which have a sign on them, like we uh, indicated earlier. Um, I haven't put in all the, all the signs. I couldn't be bothered to do all the signs on this picture, but you get the idea. You'll notice that each bridge 
whether it's got a plus or a minus sign, carries a little normal vector along with it. So here we've got a, uh, a vector going in this direction, carried across and to the same, in the same direction over here. So that means that we can't join, say, this, where I'm indicating this circle to this circle by a bridge because the orientations don't match. Now, we call that, um, we call those two, <clears throat> two circles um, with, with this incoherent, we, we call them incoherent circles or with incoherent orientations because, um, because their orientations don't match when we go from one to the other, right? Whereas these, you see, do match and they can be joined by a bridge. And all these circles which are nested like this, they all have the same orientation. In this case, it's anti-clockwise and here it's clockwise. And as you see, if, the, if you've got two nested sets and if one is oriented anti-clockwise, it can be joined to a set which are clockwise oriented by bridges. But you can't join two anti-clockwise oriented nested sets by bridges. You have to go indirectly via other nested sets of circles. Now, um, if all the cipher circles are nested, then we have uh, what's called a braided diagram or an annular diagram. So let's have a look at that. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back to that picture so here this is actually a diagram of a figure eight and it's got two positive bridges, two negative bridges corresponding to two positive crossings and two negative crossings. And the diagram is nested and, um, and so braided in this sense here. Now, if we look, see what that looks like in the actual figure eight knot, we we have, this is the usual picture of the figure eight, and this is the braided version. And we can get from here to here by a sequence of Reitermeister moves. Remember there were three Reitermeister moves you could do. And so as a little exercise for the reader, you can see how to get from here to here using uh, Reitermeister moves. Now, the thing about a braided diagram is if you get right into the middle of these nested ciphered circles and you think of it as a knot, then the knot is, imagine perpendicular to the plane, you've got a, a, a thick rod going through, then the knot winds round the rod all in one direction, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So that's what's happening here with the cipher circles. They're all going in the same direction around the rod, which is situated right in the center here. 
So that's what we mean by a braided diagram. Now, generally, we won't have a braided diagram. So we've got to try and change every diagram into a braided diagram. So what is obstructing us are the presence of incoherent ciphered circles. So here's some circles I've drawn with orientation and <clears throat> A and B are incoherent, you see, because I, I can't join them by a bridge because the orientations don't match. And A and C are incoherent, same for the same reason, I can't join them by a bridge. In principle, I could join B and C by a bridge, but I can't because there's this circle in the way. <clears throat> and we let H be the number of incoherent pairs of circles. So in this situation here, H is two and H is, a, is an obstruction to making the diagram um, braided. If we can reduce H to zero, then we do have a braided diagram. Okay. And amazingly, we can do that with just one cipher, well, sorry, just one Reitermeister move. That is the second Reitermeister move. Okay, so here's two um, incoherent cipher. This is a pair of incoherent ciphered circles. If H is positive, we know obviously that there are a pair of incoherent ciphered circles. And it's not too easy to see not only that there are such a pair, but there, there are a pair which could in theory be joined by a path which doesn't meet the rest of the diagram. Now we go from that situation to here, so we do a, a non-parallel R2 move, a non-parallel Reitermeister 2 move, creating two new crossings here. And in terms of the change to the Seifert graph is that we introduce a new circle corresponding to this circle here and two new bridges. And what we've done is we have changed the, <coughs> one of the pairs <coughs> of incoherent circles They've been eliminated, so H is now reduced by one. So if we keep doing this, H will eventually become zero. We will have proved Alexander's theorem, which says that every knot can be represented by a diagram which is braided. So um, that's the proof. Um, okay. So that's a, a proof of Alexander's theorem. Um, Scott made a good point when he said, supposing you had two nested sets of ciphered circles, one oriented clockwise and the other oriented anti-clockwise, then you would have H equal to zero, but they don't look braided. Well, it's all a matter of perspective. Um, if you imagine that instead of on a plane, you're really on a, a sphere, you can move the point of, it in, of infinity to inside one of this nested pair. And, and then they would look braided. Or alternatively, you can one by one take the circles and <clears throat> pass, pass them underneath the other nested pair. 
using the Reidermeister moves. So um, that's a good point, but uh, it's, it's easy to get over it. Now going to talk about braids. Why are these diagrams called um, braided if they're all, if there are no <coughs> incoherent pairs? <coughs> That's because um, if, if we look at say, um, what, what we think of as a braid, which is a commonplace thing, um, so I've got this picture here. Okay, so that's um, that's a, a braid going all the way around that uh, Celtic piece of Celtic art, um, and people have been using braids since well, since I don't know when, thousands of years. Um, just in the same way they've used knots, but um, braids, presumably people braided their hair a long time ago. Um, and it's, uh, it's, as, it's associated, braids themselves are associated to knots in, a, in a, an easy fashion, as we'll see. So the first person to write a serious paper about this was Emile Artin. So let's have a look at a picture of him. Here he is. Okay, German mathematician who moved to the States after the last World War. And um, Although he wasn't the first to consider braids, it was his paper which was the first serious attempt to put it all on a mathematical um, position. So let's have a look at a typical braid. So I've written it here as, um, as a number of, in this case, four parallel oriented lines. <coughs> all oriented in the same direction and with a number of uh, bridges, red bridges, which are annotated with a plus or a minus sign, like so. So that's a typical braid and um, we can convert, well let's have a look what it looks like if we convert the bridges back into um, crossings. Okay, so this could become a could become a knot if we join up the one end of these strings. These are st four strings here. We join them up. Um, we will get a, a diagram. So I try and show that by looking at the um, let's take a pencil and join them up like so and like, like so. And there we have a diagram. And this is a knot with three components, I think. One, um, well, this is, this is one component and this is another component here and this one is a third component. So it's a three, component knot or sometimes called a link and it's represented by a braided diagram. It's called a braided diagram because it's the closure of this braid and we know by Alexander's theorem that
that every knot can be represented in this way. Okay, so let's uh, clear that. Um, what have we got in the next? Um, okay, so here's another picture of a braid. And okay, this is the picture with the bridges, and we place the bridges by crossings like here and so if we number the levels of the four strings by one two three and four and then follow them along the strings we get a permutation so for instance one here goes to three so if the braid is a this is a of one and so on. One is A of two, four is A of three, and two is A of four. Okay, so associated with every braid is a permutation. Now, down here I've written the braid in terms of generators, right? These um, are designated by sigma. So it's sigma two times sigma one bar times sigma three. Now, um, why is that? Well, if I look at the original braid, sigma two, because the, as I go from left to right, the first crossing or bridge I come to is on the starts on the second level. And so that's sigma two. The next one I come to is sigma one. It starts on the first level, but it's got a bar on it because it's a minus bar on its head. And then the next one we come to is on the third level and it's sigma three. So this is the braid, <coughs> which is notated as sigma two, sigma one bar, sigma three. So that's a form of multiplication, which you take a, a word in the sigmas and you put them side by side to make a um, to make a string, which is a word representing the braid. So let's see what that means. Um, so, and, uh, so here we have two braids, A and B, and they have to have the same number of strings. And so here's the top string, here's the bottom string, and in between there are various strings in between. And a is on the left, B is on the right, and we combine the two by placing them next to one another, and the resulting string AB represents the product of those two braids. Okay, so we have uh, an algebra, a monoid, if you like, um, defined by this kind of multiplication. Now, there is another kind of multiplication. So if I go, um, let's have a look, see what else we've got. So, so for instance, if we go back here, you see, we, if I, so if I, let's annotate that picture, if I can. So I've got a, a braid here. Okay, which is signal two. I can draw a sigma. 
And I've got another braid here. And another one here. And so that's Sigma one, but it's got a bar on it because it's got a minus sign and then we've got Sigma three here. Okay, so that's how the multiplication goes. Uh, and as I said, it's, it, so far it's, a, it's a, what's called a monoid. It's just a collection of strings which you multiply by placing them next to each other. Okay, now what have we got in slide? Ah, oh, okay, I should undo that. Clear. All drawings, okay. <clears throat> we can also stack braids one on top of the other. Um, so this is braid A, this is braid B. They don't have to have the same number of strings this time. They can have any number of strings they like, but of course they're separated by this white space here. And we could write that <coughs> <coughs> stacking, excuse me. We can write that stacking either as a, as a pair or as a tensor product. Um, you can take your pick. And so we can write the generators, um, which I call sigma i, going from one to n minus one, if there are n, n strings, and um, they, that's performed by stacking this simple cross or bridge here on top of uh, identities. You know, clearly the braid where nothing happens is an identity. So we, we've stacked these braids together and to get sigma i, okay, it goes from the i to the i plus one. Right now, certain things which should be obvious, and I'll try and demonstrate, faraway braids commute. So if, if the two braids are stacked, then they commute. Okay, so here, well, I've got A is going to represent either sigma i or sigma i bar and b is going to represent sigma j or sigma j bar which i've written plus or minus at the top so in this case the product a b is the same as the product b a provided i and j where they start the difference is bigger than one okay so in that case they're separated they're stacked and so they commute um, and then we have another relation called the Yang-Baxter relation. And I will try and indicate why that works. So this involves, this is a, a, a cubic relation. Sigma i times sigma i minus one times sigma i is the same as sigma i minus one times sigma i is at sigma i minus one. So it's represented by this kind of brickwork here is the same as this brickwork here. So let me try by annotating if I can draw that. Okay, so we've got sigma i is the first one. Okay, so it goes here. And then we've got sigma i minus one so it comes down here and then we have sigma i again which is here so here we have this braid with three crossings 
put that orientation on them. And that is the same as if we do it this way around. So sigma i minus one, so that goes like this. And then we have sigma i. And then we have sigma i minus one. So that goes like that. And then this one comes up here. Okay, and we put orientations on them like that. And now you may recognize this as a Reitermeister three move. <clears throat> and there are various ways of interpreting this. You can look at this, uh, the, the, the strings now are on three levels. There's the top one here. There's the in-between one here, and then there's the bottom one here. So you can think of the top one as moving across this arc. That's um, so, sorry, this top string moving across this crossing, okay, so that's one way of, that crossing now has been brought down to here, so that's one way of interpreting it, or it's this in-between arc, which is now moving between this crossing here to go down here, so that's a, another interpretation, or you can say the bottom arc moves underneath this crossing, okay, which is the other interpretation. Uh, there's, the, there's the under arc and the crossing is now here instead of being here. So three ways of looking at this, but this is the Reitermeister three move and it gives the relationship here. Now, uh, let's clear that. And now, braids form a group, BN. That, that N indicates the number of um, strands. And what that means is that if you've got sigma I, should be, sig should be sigma i here, down here, and sigma i bar next to one another, they cancel, and that's because of the Reitermeister two move, which I'm trying to get a picture. Um, okay, so I've got the annotations up already, so, so I do, Sigma to start with. Oh, hmm. I don't know. I want to. Whoops, come here. Right. So I've got this. Okay, that's the sigma i. Then we do sigma i bar, which is like that. And that, of course, by an R2 move, in this case a parallel R2 move, we could eliminate that <coughs> to get this picture here. But we could have we could have done it the other way around. So we could have done this and. And that's also, um, so that would be sigma i bar times sigma i. Okay, so they cancel either way. And so that forms, <coughs> braids form a group because remember that a group um, has the properties that it's a, you can multiply. Every element has an inverse because there's an identity element. <coughs> Excuse me.
and um, and also there's an associative law. Remember that um, if we have, if I can write down what that is, if I've got three braids, A, B, okay, and we multiply them together, put a bracket around them, and then we multiply again by C, that's the same as if we multiply A times B, B times C, okay? So that's one of the conditions for a group. And, well, you can uh, convince yourself that that's true. I'm not going to go into the details. So that's the associative law. So we've got the associative law. We have an inverse. We have um, the relationship, which is the... Um, let's go back a bit. which is the Yang-Baxter relationship here. And we have that faraway braids commute. So um, those are the conditions. So let's clear all drawings. And we have a group BN. Um, right, so... So if we recap then about the braid group, so let's have a look. We have um, ah, we want to go here, I think. <coughs> we have a group which has got n minus one generators, sigma i, and these generators commute, sigma i times sigma j is the same as sigma j times sigma i, provided their difference is greater than one. If they're not, if their difference is one, then you have this Yang-Baxter relation, sigma i, sigma i minus one, sigma i is the same as sigma i minus one, sigma i, sigma i minus one. So. This actually, if we ignore inverse signs, we actually have a monoid. So I'll write that as M N. That's just by compo <clears throat> If you have a word in the sigma i's, you can get, they represent another word in the sigma i is if you do these replacements. So whenever sigma i and sigma j are next to one another and i minus j is bigger than one, you can replace them by sigma j, sigma i. And similarly, if you've got this, this triple of sigmas, you can replace it by this triple of sigmas. Okay, notice that the, the length of the word stays the same. So there's a natural monoid homomorphism from um, mn to the positive integers just by taking the length of the word. Now this monoid embeds in the group bn. That might seem obvious to you, um, but it's it requires a proof. Okay, you can convert any monoid into um, into a group by just saying I'm going to invert or allow every element to be inverted okay that's uh, something you can do and um, so that's what you do with MN and then you get BN but it's not necessarily true that the result uh, gives an embedding. For, let me give you an example. If I take a monoid with one generator X, say, and this has the um, 
property that if I square x, x times x, that's the same as x, okay? Then <coughs> the monoid you can easily see just consists of two elements, the identity and x, because as soon as you start powering it up, it reduces to any power of x is just becomes x, okay? On the other hand, if you make that into a group, you have cancellation, so x becomes one. So this, the groupification of that monoid is just the trivial group. So this doesn't embed in here, but, but in this case, this monoid does embed in BM. <coughs> that means that you can, um, you can make this BN into an ordered group by saying that A, some braid A is less than a braid B if, now let's see if I got this ran the right way. I think it's A inverse B is in the monoid. Okay, so that's the condition to make this an order. And this order is invariant under left multiplication. So if A less than B, that implies, I think I've got it the right way around. You'll soon see if I haven't, if I haven't got it wrong, if I got it the wrong way around, it's a right orientation, but anyway. So that means CA is less than CB. So <clears throat> the, this um, property of being less than is invariant under left multiplication. So it's what's called a left ordering. And amazingly enough, the braid group has not only got one left ordering, it's got an infinite number of left orderings. And we might give a proof or a demonstration of that later on. Maybe we can persuade Dale to give the talk. Okay. Right, now we come to the final thing I want to talk about today, and that is Markov's theorem. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to stop sharing. And, right, let's see what um, Markov's theorem is. So let's have a look at this picture here. So, right, so <clears throat> Markov was the son of the Markov associated with Markov chain. So this is Andrei Markov Jr. And these are the two Markov moves, which I've written here, M1 and M2. So we take a braid A and we conjugate it by B. Okay, so it's B inverse A B, okay, which I've drawn as a diagram here. I'll put in the inputs here. Okay, and the other Markov move, which I've written as A going to A comma sigma. Sigma is just, I'm just using that to denote a crossing. Okay, so so the picture looks like the following. I've taken A. A, say, belongs to um, BN. So it's, an, it's got N strings. And then we add another string. So to make N plus one strings. And then we take this string and introduce a crossing here on the right. Okay. 
like so. So that changes A here to A comma sigma. So those are the two Markov moves. And if you, if I close them up to make a, a break, to make a, a knot diagram, <clears throat> then I think you can see that they represent the same knot. Okay, so um, I can carry B all the way around here, comes back here, it cancels with B inverse, and we just get A. Okay, so that's pretty clear. With this one, okay, we close it up here, and we close this up here, and this one here. And now you see we've now got a loop which we can eliminate by an R1 move, a Reitermeister 1 move. You see, just flip that out and we get back to A. So it's clear that either under either of these moves, the closure of the braid to form a knot diagram doesn't affect the knot. So one way is clear, but the other way, which says that if two braids represent the same knot when they're closed, then they are joined by a sequence of these two Rodermeister moves. So that's Markov's theorem, okay, which we've got here. And that has a difficult proof. Everyone has their own um, their own version of this, um, and for me, I mean, there there are many proofs in the um, in the literature, but um, I naturally will favor my own proof, which I did with um, Andy Bartholomew. Um, people may not agree, but you can find this paper here, which proves Alexander and Markov's theorems for generalized knots and it uh, has been accepted for publication, hasn't come out yet. But it's on in the archive, and it not only proves Markov's theorem in the situation for ordinary knots, which we've been, which we've been talking about, but something called generalized knots, which we haven't come to yet, but I'm sure we will very shortly, uh, there are various kinds of generalized knots, for example, um, virtual knots, welded knots, um, singular knots, flat knots, um, flat virtual knots. The important thing is, uh, I don't know if you can read this, is that the Alexander theorem will be true if the <clears throat> if the knot theory we're dealing with is regular, and the Markov theorem will be true if the knot theory is what we call normal. Okay, um, uh, so I haven't defined what I mean by regular and normal. Regular basically means that um, you can uh, you can do a, a Reitermeister 2 move um, in the theory and normal is a bit more complicated but we won't discuss that for now. Anyway, so here's a, a proof if you like hard mathematics um, you can read this. Okay, right. So let's try and sum up 
where we've got to with the Markov theorem. So um, let's have a look at a whiteboard. Let's eliminate this, uh, clear all drawings. So what we've shown is that if we've got, I wonder if I can use text, That'd be nice. No, that's not text. Yes. Okay, so if I put in here braids, okay, and then I put here, um, and up here a bit, if I put here knots. And I put in the box here. Uh, put it here a bit. So here I do mark off. Then we have something which looks a bit like an exact sequence, if you know what that means. Um, right, I want now a pen. Uh, hmm. Here we go. Uh, I want this. So, this, I've got a pencil now. So, we go from braids to knots. Okay, and this is Alexander. So this is the Alexander theorem, which says, given any braid, of course, we, we can um, do a knot. Well, that's easy enough. But Alexander says that this map is surjective. Okay, any knot comes from a braid. So this is kind of like the end of an exact sequence or something. And... Then we look at the kernel of this map. What does that mean? Supposing two braids go to the same knot, then they can be joined like a path by a sequence of Markov moves. So we have the Markov theorem here. Okay, so that's Markov. Okay, so we go, so if two braids go to the same knot, then they can be joined by a, se by a path or a sequence of Markov moves. And then what comes here? Now this, I don't know. Does, is there nothing here or is there some kind of resolution after all, these, these are categories, category of knots, braids, and Markov moves. So we can um, possibly extend this as a resolution. I don't know. That's, um, that's not, this is outside my comfort zone. Okay, so there's something for you to all think about. Right, okay, so let's stop sharing. And that just about brings me to the end of my talk, my session today. We've gone from diagrams to ciphered graphs to braids and to Markov's theorem and I will talk a little bit more about braids next lecture and something else, I don't know what yet, we'll have to see. Okay, so thank you and goodbye.